Let's continue. Chapter 13 starts the next morning as Don Quixote accompanies five of the six goat herds who meet up with six pastors dressed in black sheepskin jackets, plus two gentlemen, pentiles hombres, on horseback, with three other servants on foot. Everyone is going to see the conclusion of the strange happenings regarding the dead shepherd and the homicidal shepherdess. Note how everyone believes Marcella is guilty as charged. Now we read a fascinating dialogue between Don Quixote and Bivalvo, one of the two gentlemen on horseback, who asks our Hidalgo what was the occasion that moved him to go armed in that way through such a peaceful land. Of course, this land is not all peaceful, at least not for men like Grisostomo and Don Quixote. Of course, this land is not all peaceful, at least not for men like Grisostomo and Don Quixote. We'll contemplate the relation between love and violence throughout the novel. Don Quixote answers the question about his profession, once again emphasizing the difference between the laziness of modern courtier knights and the more laborious lifestyle of knights errant, of whom I, though unworthy, am the least of all. His fellow travelers instantly take him for a madman, and Vivaldo follows up, asking him what he meant by knights errant. Now Don Quixote delivers one of his most important glosses of chivalric myth. Due to the ongoing conflict between Spain and England around 1600, it's particularly interesting that Don Quixote should emphasize the annals and histories of England, which recounteth the famous deeds, fazañas, of King Arthur. Then he cites the myth of King Arthur's metamorphosis into a crow, stressing that it was in the days of this good king that the famous chivalric order of the Knights of the Round Table was instituted. And he ends by quoting again from the ballad of Sir Lancelot of the Lake. Never was a knight by damsels so well served as was Lancelot when from Brittany he came. We have said that Don Quixote identifies with Amadis of Gaul more than any other knight, but this is the second time he identifies with Lancelot, and he'll do so again in a major episode near the novel's conclusion. In fact, here it seems the whole tradition of chivalric adventures descends from Lancelot, spreading itself over many and various parts of the world, including Amadis and all the other knights that Don Quixote always has in mind when he endeavors to help the weak and the needy. When the goat herds and gentlemen arrive at the Sierra of the burial, Vivaldo compares the profession of knights errant to that of the most austere monks, which again gives rise to the madness of Don Quixote, who insists that knights suffer far more than monks because, like soldiers say of their captains, we implement what they command. Don Quixote finishes this stage of his speech, insisting that knights errant deserved to be emperors through the valor of their arms, and that if they hadn't been aided by certain sages and sorcerers, they'd have ended up thwarted in their good intentions and deeply deceived in their aspirations. This idea that knights depend on black magic is the opening sought by Vivaldo, who grows increasingly impertinent throughout the dialogue. He challenges Don Quixote's thinking, observing that when knights are about to undertake their adventures, they never at that moment remember to commend their souls to God, as every Christian is obliged to do in such dangers, but rather commend themselves to their ladies with such zeal and devotion as if they were their God, adding that all this smells of paganism. Don Quixote counters that time and place are left to them to do that in the remainder of the story, but Vivaldo won't back down and brings up the example of two knights who challenge each other to the death, and in the middle of their charge, they commend themselves to their ladies, for if the episode ends with the death of one of them, then obviously he had no time to commend himself to God. Cervantes is making great fun of the moral debates of his day, especially the art of casuistry, or case-by-case -case reasoning. At the conclusion of Vivaldo and Don Quixote's conversation, they discuss the name, country, rank, and beauty of Dulcinea. Don Quixote deploys an hilarious version of the blason, a portrait device used by the period's poets who associated their mistresses' various body parts with luxury items and iconic symbols of beauty. 
her hair is gold, her forehead Elysian fields, her eyebrows heaven's arches, her eyes sunsets, her cheeks roses, her lips coral, her teeth pearls, and on it goes. Obviously, Cervantes mocks his hero, and the passage suggests, again, a certain male obsession with ethnic purity. Moreover, when Bivalbo requests that Dulcinea's lineage, ancestry, and family be revealed, Don Quixote must admit that she is not of noble descent, but he argues that she is of the Toboso family of La Mancha, a line which, though modern, can make for a generous start to the most illustrious families of centuries to come. Now we turn to Grisostomo's equally symbolic funeral. Down from the pass between two high mountains came roughly 20 pastors, all dressed in black wool jackets, and they carry a bier on which is seen a dead body covered with flowers. This is the novel's first dead body. There will be others. Let's look closely. The episode signals literature as an institution deeply involved in the relation between love and death. On the same bier were some books and many papers, both open and folded. Cervantes cites Dante's Inferno, for Grisostomo died in the middle of his life's journey, and then Virgil, the divine Mantuan, for the deceased left many papers, but like Virgil, he ordered that they be delivered to the flames once his body had been delivered to the ground. Suddenly, there is misogyny in the air. Ambrosio, Grisostomo's friend, indicates where to open the grave. There is where he told me he first spied that mortal enemy of the human race. Similarly, when Bivaldo insists on reading Grisostomo's poetry, he twice refers to the example of Marcella's cruelty. 